My name is uh, Dr. James Orbinski. I'm uh, the inaugural director of the Dardalai Institute for Global Health Research at uh, York University. Um, I have uh, uh, worked internationally and continue to work internationally on global health issues for about 30 years. Uh, I worked with uh, Médecins Sans Frontières for uh, our Doctors of the Borders uh, for a good 15 uh, years, uh, largely in the field, uh, and uh, was eventually elected international president of MSF. Uh, and um, uh, have been involved in many different initiatives uh, outside of MSF and as well as inside. I was involved in uh, creating and launching a not-for-profit drug development company uh, that is now a global enterprise called DNDI, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. I uh, was also involved in starting a, a uh, hybrid academic NGO focused on research and service for people with HIV uh, in the developing world. It's called Dignitas. Um, and um, now I'm uh, uh, director of the, this new uh, Institute of Global Health Research at York. Uh, we've been uh, up and running now for two years, uh, and we have three themes, planetary health, global health and humanitarianism, uh, and global health foresighting. And I'd encourage you to go to the website uh, to take a look at the range of, of research that, uh, that we're engaged in. Um, it really is path breaking and uh, we're doing everything from modeling the health impacts of climate change uh, in the developing world to developing um, safe water optimization tools that draw on uh, digital platforms, artificial intelligence and biosensors, combining those technologies to create very practical tools to improve water quality uh, in refugee camps or in uh, um, uh, IDP or internally displaced person settings. Uh, and so on. I very much encourage you to take a look at the website. I think you'd really quite, uh, quite enjoy it. The COVID pandemic has many different manifestations uh, in different parts of the world. Um, there are, there is obviously a single overall trajectory, uh, but where each country is at uh, in terms of uh, its particular uh, epidemic, uh, is specific to that particular country. So, for example, one country may be early in the epidemic, one country may be late in the epidemic, uh, one country may be at some midpoint uh, in the normal trajectory of the epidemic. And therefore, the kind of responses uh, that one offers internationally have to be specific uh, to the country uh, that you're going to be, or to the region you're going to be working in. And just the complexity of understanding the particular uh, dynamic of the epidemic in a particular country versus the global uh, um, uh, reality is, is a challenge. It's an operational challenge. It's a logistical challenge. It's a public health challenge. Uh, it requires multiple um, partners, uh, multiple levels of expertise being applied in different ways and different times in different places. So you can, you can imagine um, uh, how complex that is. Part of the public health response uh, in terms of efforts to contain and control and mitigate uh, the spread of COVID has meant that, that uh, travel restrictions have been placed on uh, uh, civilians, uh, uh, aid workers, uh, and all others, uh, literally around the world. Uh, I can't uh, quote the exact number of countries, but I believe it's somewhere around 190 uh, now have a travel restriction of one kind or another that are related to COVID. Uh, aid workers are uh, uh, affected by this very dramatically. Uh, and whether that's uh, aid workers uh, with non-government organizations, with UN agencies, uh, or civil servants that work uh, internationally uh, um, uh, with governments, um, they're all affected by this. And this, this radically impacts the operationality and the ability uh, of uh, uh, normal humanitarian actors to actually engage, understand, and then respond to a particular, uh, a particular emergency. One of the key elements um, in terms of controlling uh, the spread of COVID is uh, proper uh, hygiene practices and proper sanitation practices. 
Um, and this, uh, these vary, as we all understand, these vary across cultures uh, and across uh, um, uh, regions of the world. Uh, there are different practices uh, for maintaining appropriate levels of, of, uh, of uh, hygiene uh, and sanitation. Um, and so what this means then is that any effort around infection prevention and control or IPC as it's called, any effort around uh, that from a global perspective has to be locally specific. It has to be in a local language and it has to be culturally appropriate. Uh, and so this again poses enormous challenges just in terms of the, the scale and the complexity of that messaging uh, around the world. The World Health Organization plays a really vital role uh, uh, in terms of understanding um, this epidemic and also now in terms of responding to it. Uh, typically, the WHO uh, or the World Health Organization has been an advisory body to nation states around uh, health matters. And that's certainly true in this case, uh, and it has played that role. Um, it also, since, um, uh, since the Ebola uh, epidemic, uh, in 2014, it's taken on a, an additional role of providing emergency technical support uh, to countries uh, uh, that, that need it uh, around, for example, contact tracing, around public health measures, uh, and so on. And, and just uh, recently, in the last few days, WHO will be, uh, has, uh, has launched an appeal, in fact, for uh, $675 million uh, that it will allow it uh, to fund uh, part of its response to the COVID pandemic, which will include not simply technical support, uh, but also um, uh, uh, material support uh, in terms of personnel, in terms of training, in terms of equipment, and so on. It's also working um, uh, very importantly with OCHA, which is the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, which is a UN-based uh, office uh, or UN-based agency, uh, is playing a vital role uh, in um, efforts around the global uh, COVID pandemic. Um, it typically coordinates humanitarian response among various actors, whether they're UN agencies, NGOs, multilateral uh, organizations, nation states. It typically for, uh, coordinates and directs um, uh, humanitarian relief efforts. Um, and in this particular case, it is very rightly assuming a leadership role in terms of setting priorities, in terms of defining a framework uh, for response, and also in terms of uh, launching an initial campaign uh, to raise appropriate funds uh, to, to begin to deliver uh, on a response to COVID. It's asked for $2 billion to support um, uh, its COVID initiative. That's nothing. That's the, that, that is a very, very small sum of money relative uh, to what is needed. The Secretary General of the United Nations um, yes, yesterday um, said that uh, it will take a minimum of $2.5 trillion uh, as an aid package uh, to the developing world to deal with uh, the impacts of COVID. And personally, I actually think that's an underestimate. There has been a lot of prior experience, at least in the last uh, 30 years, um, uh, with uh, uh, pandemic disease. Um, there is a wealth of experience there uh, that we can certainly draw on uh, to um, help us engage more meaningfully and more effective uh, responses uh, to this uh, COVID pandemic. That said, this is a new world. Uh, the world today is very different than even the world of, of 2014 when, um, when Ebola uh, uh, was the major pandemic uh, of the day. Uh, and very different again of the world of 2003 when SARS uh, was, was, a, was a pandemic disease. We're much more interdigitated uh, as a world. Our population is, is, is greater. Uh, there's an even higher degree, um, on orders of magnitude, greater degree uh, of uh, integration in terms of trade, travel, finance, um, uh, and, and movement of goods, people, 
uh, and, and cross-border services. Um, and we see that, for example, in the impact of, of the COVID pandemic on supply chains, on supply chain management. Um, we also see the impact of fragile supply chain and globally fragile supply chain management systems on the ability to respond from a humanitarian perspective. Um, the politics of the world today are very different uh, than the world of, of, uh, uh, of 2014, 2003, to use the two examples that I'm citing. Uh, we are now a multipolar world. The, the, the centrality and relevance of the United Nations is no longer what it once was. Uh, and yet the functional necessity uh, of the United Nations has rarely been more evident uh, than it is today. There is no other institutional architecture that exists in the world at a global level. Uh, and there is no other uh, prepared uh, institutional architecture as prepared as the United Nations is to actually deal with this. What's needed now is massive political support uh, for uh, appropriate use of that architecture and appropriate use of those resources to really deal effectively uh, with this pandemic most especially in the developing world. Academic institutions and the research that takes place in such institutions plays a really vital role uh, in pandemic preparedness. Um, at York, uh, for example, we are now putting together uh, and have been over the last six months um, a, an initiative around uh, disaster and health emergency uh, research, training, and simulation uh, so that uh, communities in Canada and internationally are better prepared uh, to deal with uh, disaster and health emergencies like pandemic prepared, like uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. That uh, initiative, which we're well on the way of, of, uh, 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 of bringing forward, we started some about a year ago, um, but that initiative uh, will have really, uh, if successful, will have a major impact uh, in terms of helping governments and communities prepare in advance uh, and in the actual extremist circumstances of, a, of an emergency um, to respond appropriately uh, so that um, uh, responses are more effective, more equitable, more just, uh, and, and more appropriate uh, to maintaining the viability of, 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 uh, of communities and societies. In my experience as a physician, I've worked for about 30 years in, internationally and with Médecins Sans Frontières and with the other organizations. I've worked in war, in famine, uh, in epidemic disease, uh, even in situations of genocide. And um, I think what I've learned uh, is, I've learned many things, but one of the things that I've learned in terms of equity is that equity and consideration of the most vulnerable is not an afterthought. It can't be what you do when you've got everything else right. It has to be the first thing that you do. And if you, if you focus firstly on the most vulnerable, inevitably you will get everything right. Uh, and everyone within a society will be treated fairly, justly, uh, and equitably, and treated according to need, uh, and not according to status or privilege. And that, I think, is, 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 is a fundamental set of, of, of values that are core uh, to, to humanitarianism and, and core to, to my understanding of, of, of what humanitarianism is. Many uh, uh, Canadian public officials, uh, Prime Minister, Premiers, uh, and others uh, have spoken um, near, on a daily basis uh, now um, uh, around the COVID uh, pandemic and our domestic reality. And I have to say that overall, um, I think they've got the message right, uh, and they are responding appropriately to the changing dynamics of uh, um, the epidemic uh, here in Canada. Um, these are moving targets uh, and one has to respond uh, um, in the best way possible given the best evidence that you have on hand today. Uh, and that evidence changes and therefore the response must change. 
and I think overall, there's been a few hiccups, not too many, but there's been a few hiccups. Uh, but overall, I think our uh, officials and our political leadership, um, federally and provincially, have largely got it right um, so far. Uh, and I just wish them the best over the next uh, weeks and months uh, in their leadership uh, and in their ability to continue you know, to, to get it right. The Doddle Institute for Global Health Research at York uh, is a new institute. We've been up and running now for about two years. Uh, and um, we're focused on uh, three main themes. One is planetary health. The second is global health and humanitarianism. And the third is global health foresighting or looking to the future and imagining what kind of global health we want. Uh, given the reality of the uh, COVID pandemic, we've taken this on as a major, major issue. We've created a, a portal, a COVID global health and humanitarianism portal, uh, and encourage all uh, uh, alumni to take a look at it. Um, that portal is focused on a daily uh, update uh, from a global health and humanitarian perspective on uh, the pandemic. Um, and um, it also provides uh, resources, curated resources and knowledge tools um, around um, clinical public health, water, sanitation and hygiene, um, access uh, to, um, uh, to treatment and uh, research and development, equity uh, and protection, um, and, um, uh, and then a, uh, a curated uh, problem analysis, if you will, around contemporary issues. Um, this is designed for practitioners uh, and policy uh, people uh, who are uh, looking for practical, up-to-date resources and tools. Uh, and uh, we're already seeing, we managed to get this up and running in, in less than a week, uh, and we've seen a very significant amount of traffic on it. So obviously, uh, we're, do, we're doing something right. Our partners, uh, we have a steering committee that includes UN agencies, some NGOs, uh, academics, uh, and so on. And we are constantly iterating and redesigning uh, the overall structure uh, because we are literally uh, learning by doing as, as, as we deal with, uh, with the reality of the epidemic.